Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, this is Cardam here and Dina Hi. to my right. And uh, we are the co-directors of the Bay Area Mandala Project. We're pleased to present our workshop today with Michael uh, Cornwall called Responding to Extreme States with Loving Receptivity, Honoring the Spirit's Transformative Journey. So first we'll start with just an overview. We're going to touch on some topics. We'll do an introduction and then we'll look at the connection between spirituality and mental health. Then we'll hear a little bit from Michael and Dina about their story. And then Michael will talk even more in depth about his being with extreme states training. And then there'll be some time for question and answers for us to have a dialogue. So uh, we're really looking forward to connecting with all of you. Uh, you may hear there's a siren in the background. <laughs> Hopefully, whoever they're going to is OK. So uh, just a little bit about me. Um, by the time I was 36, I realized I could have two types of outer body experiences. The first type of experience was a response to being abused as a child and getting outside of my body was a way for me to feel safe. The other type was when I was much older and I was meditating. And in that meditation experience, I was transported to the cosmos outside of my body to have a direct conversation with God or the divine source. Both experiences made it possible for me to be presenting to you all today uh, and to others who we've spoken with because for me, I'm not afraid to stand in someone else's shoes and to believe your experience of an altered state. Uh, my conversation with God invited me to delve deeper into this phenomenon. Uh, and I spent time in graduate school researching this type of extreme or altered state experience. I was fortunate enough to locate and interview those who had had similar experiences of a divine encounter. Uh, in my manuscript, they're referred to as theophanies. So prior to their intense spiritual experiences, I saw that many of them had been in some sort of existential crisis or uh, under some emotional duress. And I call this project uh, the Mandala Project because for me it symbolized the transformative journey back to self. In other words, how do you navigate through the chaos of an ecstatic, spiritual, or altered state and then be able to reintegrate back into your life? So in a nutshell, like Jack, Cor Jack Cornfield says, how do you get back to doing the laundry? Our capacity to hold space for these life-altering and often chaotic and frightening experiences can contribute to a clearer understanding of one's path. When we're experiencing altered states accompanied by high levels of emotional distress, being in a supportive environment and help with compassion and loving kindness can have a great impact on our mental health and overall well-being. So in this workshop, we'll explore the universality of intense spiritual experiences as an opportunity for transformation and self-awareness. We'll hear directly from Dr. Michael Cornwall and Dina Tyler, who have taken on intense spiritual experiences and learn how they practice being with individuals in these altered states to shepherd them through the chaos towards greater stability and reintegration. At present, the mental health system has limited experience incorporating treatment for spiritual experiences. So as a result, many transitional age youth and adult consumers are inappropriately diagnosed and or treated as a danger to themselves or society. So many of those experiencing emotional crisis as a result of intense spiritual experience can end up homeless hospitalized or overly medicated. However, we don't want this to be misconstrued as an oversimplification of the effects that trauma and adverse environmental influences can play in our experiences of psychoemotional distress. 
and this should also be taken into consideration when providing therapeutic assistance. A book written in 1989 entitled Spiritual Emergency, When Personal Transformation Becomes a Crisis, edited by Dr. Stan Slop and Christina Groff, with the esteemed contributions of Artie Lang, John Weir Perry, and Jack Cornfield are among the great works on this topic. David Lou Koff, uh, PhD, trains mental health professionals globally on spiritual emergencies. He's the author of the, the co-author of the DSM-4 category, Religious or Spiritual Problem, focusing on mystical experiences as a type of spiritual problem that can present as a mental disorder. However, if recognized and treated as a spiritual experience, it can benefit the individual and help them to avoid unnecessary use of hospitalization and medication. And for more information, you can visit his website, spirituality, spiritualcompetency.com. A SAMHSA-funded technical assistance center sponsored a workshop where participants from around the country helped to contribute to a valuable resource tool. And this resource tool offers guidelines on how to support and honor individuals undergoing intense spiritual experiences. Alameda County Behavioral Health Care Services hosted a training called Psychosis as a Spiritual Crisis, an Opportunity for Growth. This Oakland training also grew out of an Esalen Institute workshop that was put on by Michael Cornwall, Jay Mahler, David Lukoff, and Laura Mancuso in a previous year, and that was called An Integrative Approach to Psychosis and Other Transformative Spiritual Experiences. Out of the Alameda County workshop sprung the, sprung the seed that gave life to the Bay Area Mandala Project which is a diverse group of consumers, family members, and mental health and medical professionals holding expertise in psychiatric crises and who serve as advocates for recovery-oriented services. The Bay Area Mandala Project believes in an engagement philosophy focused on wellness, resiliency, recovery, and healthy lifestyle choices. Our mission is to develop comprehensive psychosocial recovery-oriented services for consumers going through extreme emotional states, commonly referred to as psychosis or mania. The Bay Area Mandala Project shows the mandala <clears throat> because it's representative of the universe. In Sanskrit, it means, or it's referred to as Garba, Garba Datu, or womb world. And according to Jung, it's the archetype of the self urging the person to become what one is, providing a sense of order and meaning. We'll explore the strategy of being with instead of doing to as an accessible tool for averting prolonged crisis and supporting healing. Our logo, designed by Dina, is based on the eight dimensions of wellness as designed by SAMHSA. The four points of our entry, uh, four points of our system diversion program, as well as the importance of being surrounded by an enveloping community, which is reflected in our community healing room. The character in the middle represents crisis as an opportunity for growth. Now you'll see our vision for the Bay Area Mandala Project, or the Mandala Project as we call it. This innovative uh, diversion system is designed to provide family members and their loved ones voluntary alternatives to hospitalization and or assisted outpatient treatment. It assists persons in earlier reoccurring psychiatric episodes of extreme distress labeled as psychosis or mania and can divert large numbers of people from ongoing dependence on the mental health and psych mental health system and psychotropic drug use. The target populations that we would look to serve in each of these components, and this is also on our website, you'll be able to see a little clearly in more detail. So one of our first components is the Mandala Sanctuary, and this is modeled after the Soteria model. So this would be for individuals experiencing a first break of extreme state 
commonly referred to as, as psychosis and or mania, who have not had extensive exposure to antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. Next would be the Mandala Crisis Alternative. This would be an alternative to psychiatric emergency services or inpatient hospitalization for those in crisis who have experienced multiple episodes of extreme states and are interested in reducing their use of antipsychotics or mood stabilizers. Next would be Mandala Respite, which is a peer respite model. This is a crisis prevention option for individuals with multiple experiences of extreme states, either on or off antipsychotics or mood stabilizers, who want to prevent an oncoming crisis. And then there's Mandala Mobile, which is for individuals experience a crisis, experiencing a crisis in their homes or in boarding care facilities. Our other components are harm reduction, which would be a service offered to those individuals wanting to come off their psychiatric medications in a safe way. And this could be administered in any of these components through any of these entry, um, in any, anywhere within the system. And then last but not least is the community healing room. This is for group and individual support around maintaining wellness while living in the community. And the components that are listed in the community healing room are also on the schematic. Our philosophy of the Barry Mandala Project is that we believe mental health crises and extreme states are multidimensional Sorry, <laughs> skip. Our multidimensional experiences, they have dimensions of the mythic, archetypal, and spiritual, and are also cultural bound, social, interpersonal, and emotionally subjective experiences. They're not pathological, but are potentially transformative natural life events, especially if heart-centered caregivers are available. The, the topics that Dina and Michael will be speaking on are how ways they were supported during their experience helped or hindered their well-being, various ways to support that can be helpful, and how seeing mental health crisis as, trans, as a transformative experience can allow you to see life differently. So now Dina's going to share how her experiences of extreme states is helping her to help others in crisis. Thank you, Carta. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Ron, for setting this webinar up for us um, and for the opportunity to share my story with you all. Like many of us, um, our stories are very complex. There's a lot um, to my whole journey, and um, I'm just going to try and highlight some of, you know, what came before my extreme states and um, then how it shaped me to do what I do now. Um, as a child, I was very, very quiet. Um, there was a lot of arguing and yelling going on in my house um, growing up, and I kind of retreated into my own world. I became very mute. I wouldn't talk very much and just isolated, stayed in my room. And um, kind of, uh, I also started having lots of experiences of, um, you know, being connected to another world. To, um, I would see spirits, and I would see a ghost in my house. Um, and I also received a lot of communication. I was given a lot of messages. I started hearing voices at a very young age, um, around like five or six years old. And um, they would be, tormenting me a lot. Um, they would yell at me and be very mean. And it made me a really, really frightened young girl um, in the house, just seeing things and um, then everything that I was hearing as well. Uh, then um, when I uh, was about like 15 years old, um, I started to feel this really dark, evil energy with me. And um, I felt it was a demon uh, with me for about a, a year, and it was really frightening. Um, and I went to a psychic who helped me to work with that energy to um, change my fear of it into love 
Um, and so she looked at these energies as um, the evil forces uh, are often attracted to the fear. And so they grow off of that and feed off of that. So by changing that energy, I could bring back the power and um, the force actually um, left and went away. Um, and But when I got into high school um, in my senior year, I um, started, I was I always had uh, problems reading. Um, I was a slow reader. I had trouble focusing. So I ended up getting diagnosed with attention deficit disorder uh, and was put on a prescription of Ritalin and then later on Adderall, sustained relief. And uh, when I went off to um, college, uh, things were fine the first year, but um, I started to um, not be able to eat and sleep as much. And um, I had a couple um, things that just made me start to detach from my body more. I had, I, um, had a experience where um, I was actually held captive for two days by someone and roofied and date raped. Um, and so this experience really started to make me disconnect from my body, leave this place because I just did not feel safe. Um, and I, uh, that year in college, I started to um, be, go into catatonic states where I would not know how much time had passed. I would sit and stare at a wall and I would just be lost in this other world, not here, um, not in my body. And um, and I got diagnosed with severe depression. Um, I had to drop out of college and went back home and um, was put on antidepressants as well. Uh, and I spent a, about a year um, there. And then I decided to come off my antidepressant. Uh, what happened after two weeks of um, withdrawing from the antidepressant is I ended up not being able to sleep at all. And I had um, just gotten a, a kitten, um, and she was very playful at night, and she would um, keep me up at night. And by the third night of not being able to sleep, I no longer needed any sleep. I was, had so much energy, felt was feeling so good. And um, I, uh, on the fifth night without sleep, um, I was really just thinking on this whole nother level. I had all this energy and this like amazing like ability to make connections between all these thoughts, you know, and, and everything that I was experiencing, everything that was going on in the world. Um, and a lot of it um, focused on why I was so unhappy. And I started looking at my cat and thinking, well, what does she need to be happy? Well, she needs food, water, shelter. She needs love. She needs something to play with. And um, she needs to be pet. She needs that, you know, sense of another connection. Um, and so then I started translating that to human beings and to myself. And well, we all need those basic human needs of food, water, shelter. We need love. We need connection. We need belonging. We need purpose. And um, we also need self-esteem. And at on the fifth night of staying up all night long, um, the next day I was just like. Oh my gosh, when I connected all of these things together, it was like, this is the meaning of life. I discovered the meaning of life, and I needed to share it with everyone, because this was going to make me famous. I was actually going to become president of the United States, and I was going to run against Chelsea Clinton. This was back in 2001, and I was just like seeing how the steps in my life were going to play out, and that I had discovered this meaning of life that was going to change the world. and. Um, I felt that if we all just focused, we created a society where we all focused on meeting these human needs, then we would be able to become the supreme human beings that we're meant to be. And um, so that day, I started calling everybody I knew, um, <laughs> called um, my family, called my friends, called um, people at the record store that I worked at, and I called just everybody I could talk to and told them I figured out the meaning of life and they just needed to listen to me. And this was a huge shock to everybody because like after going from being an extremely quiet, quiet person, now I was talking nonstop and just really like, you need to listen to me. <laughs> and um, I, anyways, what happened is I told everybody to call me back at 420 to um, remind me to leave for work um, so that I wouldn't be late for work. And when the clock struck 420, it turned out that the 
the phone was silent. No one called. And that produced this huge sense of like that no one believes me. Why wouldn't they want to keep hearing, you know, about my meaning of life and, and help me to become president of the United States? You know, I needed to get the message out there. But no one was interested. They didn't want to call me back. So, um, but and what ended up happening is um, people gathered and my mother came over and decided, you know, um, she asked me if um, what was going on. I said I, you know, hadn't been able to sleep. And she said, well, you could go back to the hospital. I had been to a partial hospitalization previously, um, but now I could go back to this hospital and it would be a safe, quiet place for me to sleep. And so I agreed. Um, and um, when I um, went to the hospital, um, it was just a very strange um, experience. Uh, no longer, uh, people wouldn't really listen to me there. Um, people actually were telling me what to do. I was not able to decide for myself certain things, like when I wanted to wash my hair. Um, I had gotten tattoos done recently, um, and they were scabbed over and needing um, to heal, and they had told me I needed to put A&D ointment on. And the hospital staff would not give it to me. They kept saying I was going to use it to kill myself. And I, I was, you know. Um, and I just kept really, I, I started becoming more aggressive because I was just like, you need to listen to me. I just want to talk. I just want to talk about what all that I had discovered. I wanted to write in my journal. They wouldn't let me write, you know. And it was just, you know, very strange to be treated in that way. Um, and what ended up happening is I ended up making friends with some of the other people um, on the hospital ward. Um, and um, one of those individuals was an older man who um, I was talking, we were talking about our partial hospitalization programs that we had been to and how they were more helpful than the inpatient because you got to at least go to groups and, um, and talk more. Uh, and he told me to come into his room because he had all of his paperwork, and we'd go over his paper, the paperwork. And um, anyways, um, he forced himself on me sexually. And when this happened, the hospital staff came and they took him off of me. But they really, they started treating me that it was that I caused this to happen. And they actually told me it was a symptom of my mania that I was hypersexual and. So that I had somehow in this state wanted this to happen. And it was, it had, it changed how I thought. Like at this hospital, I was not going to get help. I was not being treated. I was not being listened to. They were seeing me as this embodiment of symptoms. And um, so I um, decided, you know, the, and that they actually did not remove the person from the hospital ward who was staying. Um, in the room directly across the mine, and I couldn't lock my doors because of suicide checks. So I decided the only thing in my power at that point was um, to tell them to get onto the suicide watch ward. So I told them the next day that um, I tried to kill myself. Uh, and so I was moved to the suicide watch ward. And before entering the suicide ward, uh, they had to strip search me. And, you know, at 22 uh, years old, uh, this was all just incredibly traumatizing. It was, I, I just, I understood that they had ways that they had to treat and protocols that they have to follow, but it was just not the compassionate care that I needed at that time. Um, and three days later, after being moved to the suicide watch ward, my insurance ran out and they released me. <laughs> and um, so all of this experience, um, made it so that I never wanted to go back to the hospital again. Um, I uh, did everything in my power to just no longer talk about what the things that um, were happening to me that led me, you know, to be hospitalized. So I just didn't talk. I, I went back to not talking very much. Um, and I um, ended up just taking things, you know, very slowly. Um, I decided to come off of all my meds. Um, this was about 15 years ago. I um, came off seven different meds all at once. I was a very, you know, I, was, I, I just at that point wanted to no longer listen to what the professionals that were helping me were telling me. I 
I didn't trust anyone anymore. And um, so I was just doing what I needed to do. I went to um, a place that was actually, it was not designed to come help people come off their meds at all. It was actually just for intensive therapy. It was a two week place that people could go to just go through intensive therapy. And I used it as an opportunity to come off my meds because I was safe. I was away from my family, away from my doctor. And, um, and I was being fed really well, you know, nutritional, organic food. Um, and I had access to someone that I could speak to 24 hours a day that if I was struggling. And it was a really difficult physically and um, emotionally to come off of all those meds um, all at once. It was, I was on high dosages of lithium and Zyprexa, Klonopin, Tegretol. Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of different meds, and um, but I did it. And uh, when I um, went back home, um, my psychiatrist just saw me every week and made sure that I was okay. And um, it was kind of like I feel my um, my fighting spirit helped me to get through a lot during that time. Um, but all of this led me to um, want to study, you know, what happened to me during that time. I went back to school and I studied stigma, um, how the individual who is diagnosed is then treated within society because after receiving my diagnosis, all of a sudden people wouldn't really value what I said anymore. It was almost like everything that I would say was treated as it was a possible delusion or, you know, that it wasn't real. And I had a lot of, um, it, it, it took a long time to find um, a therapist that would actually truly listen to me and um, help me work through a lot of what was coming up. Um, and uh, one thing I'll mention is I actually went back to um, the ground round to, um, to, to try to have my diagnosis removed. I did not like my diagnosis, which was um, bipolar and psychosis and OS. And um, I presented my story and um, told them all about the meaning of life that I had discovered. And one of the graduate students at this grand round asked me, have you ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? And I said, no, I, I hadn't. <laughs> um, he's like, well, what you described is your meaning of life, you know, these basic human needs, and then, you know, um, ultimately um, what Maslow refers to as self-actualization is kind of what you refer to as becoming the supreme human being that you're meant to be. I was like, oh, no, no, well, that, that's cool that it, somebody else has discovered it before me. That's, you know, but, you know, I, I, I went actually a couple years later and actually read um, what he had discovered, and it was very, very similar. And I was just shocked and amazed, like, this is taught to most every psychology student, and um, I just did not understand why when I was hospitalized, and I just so desperately wanted to talk to people about what I was coming up with, why nobody could have listened to me then and, and you know, pointed out, hey, that sounds like Malville's hierarchy needs. Here's a book. Read about it. <laughs> you know, or just have that discussion with me. It was just like everything that I said was ignored and treated as not real or not meaningful. And um, that experience really, really led me to want to, um, you know, create a place that would have helped me and for other people. And it's led me to do what I do now. I work I'm currently in the mental health system with young adults 16 to 24 that have recently been given a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And I work as a, um, a peer supporter. Um, I um, have brought in peer support groups, the RAP groups into that program. Um, but we also wanted to create something for people as an alternative to a hospitalization, especially for those people that um, are falling through the cracks or are reluctant, like I was, to go seek mental health services. Um, I, you know, I did not go get help when, at times when I really, really wanted help. I wanted somebody to talk to. And so we wanted to create a place that could um, have this um, 
way of being with people, being able to listen to their experience, being able to honor their experience and, and work with them in a way to delve into the meaning of what is behind what's coming up for people. Um, often, you know, from my experience, the um, meaning of life was truly pointing out a lot of things that I was not doing in my life. I was not eating well. I was not, you know, I was isolating. I was not around people. I didn't have that social belonging. I didn't have much love in my life. I, you know, was not feeling my purpose. So all of these things came out in this way, but it was really also telling me what I needed to address in order to become the supreme human being that I could be. So um, I, I do believe that there's a lot that is within somebody's expression, what is, you know, the deeper levels of what is coming out for them that needs to be honored and listened to. And um, yeah. I'm wondering if you could give an example, if you want an example of a piece that you worked with. Yeah, um, I've um, worked with this, um, this young man who had um, really been quiet for, for many years and he was really, uh, he, he would be hearing, um, hearing voices of um, his relatives, his ancestors. Um, he would always say, you know, they're, they're all dead people, that they're, but they're telling me jokes. They're, um, and they're, it was making him really it, hard to communicate. He would just be laughing and hearing them. Uh, but he would come to my groups and he would just often just look at me and just, I could see he's in there even though he's not able to talk. He's not, um, he's just, you know, laughing. Uh, and um, Michael Cornwall and I actually went out and um, met with him and for three weeks we just walked around the lake together um, and he was very quiet and when he was quiet we would be quiet. When he would laugh, we would laugh. And about the third week, he finally said something. He's like, what do you guys want to talk about? <laughs> he actually like, started to notice us, notice that we were there with him. We had created this um, comfort that he could start to come out of his shell, come out of um, and, and be with us as well. And so um, he asked us what we wanted to talk about. We're like, what do you want to talk about? And he's like, superheroes. So we started to talk about superheroes and, you know, our favorite favorite ones. And um, it has really, like, to have him start to feel safe um, around us because we also started to talk about our experiences as well. And when he started to know, oh, okay, I'm not alone in this. Um, there's other people that have had these experiences. It, he started to talk. And um, he's been, <laughs> you know, I've just seen this amazing transformation in him and I've begun to learn so much about him and what he's gone through. And um, I truly credit it to just taking that time. It does, you know, take time and working gently with someone, but um, it has really, really been effective. Thank you so <laughs> much, Dina. Always appreciate your courage in, in your heart. Um, so thank you. And so next we will hear from Dr. Michael Cornwall, who's a blogger with Mad in America and author of Responding to Madness with Loving Receptivity, a Practical Guide. Uh, he'll explain how supporting individuals in crisis through his being with and heart-centered approach can help anyone experiencing an extreme state. Such a psychological, social, psychosocial approach can counteract the stigma and negative impact these experiences can cause in the lives of individuals and their families. And then afterwards, we'd like to hear from you, the voice of the community and all of you there in Soteria, Vermont, <laughs> and in California and, and, and abroad. Um, so we'll have a, a question and answer period to conclude the workshop. So, with no further ado, Dr. Michael Cornwall. Thank you, Cardam, and thank you so much, Ron and ISPS, for making this possible today. And uh, for everyone who's here, too, I'm really grateful that we're gathered here today to 
to share. And I'll be talking a little while now, and then uh, we'll open it up. We can have a good discussion and, and questions and answers. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say a little bit about uh, the Mandala Project and uh, kind of follow up uh, on what Cardin was saying about what we're doing here in the Bay Area. Uh, you saw the the diagram with our ambitious uh, kind of recreation or uh, filling in the huge voids in the mental health system. Uh, but for the last year or so, we've been going out and actually meeting with the people who run the mental health system and uh, have the programs that we want to partner with. I'd like to say too that our dear friend Jay Mahler that some of you may know has been a, a huge leader in, in this whole Bay Area, the state of California nationally. But around the Bay Area Mandala Project, Jay and Cardam really, I think, formed this group that first we started meeting every once in a while, uh, kind of like a support group for those of us who had these extreme experiences. And then as some money started to look like it was going to be available for some alternative services, we thought, well, why don't we just come up with ideas about how we'd like to see things uh, transformed here in the, in the Alameda County mental health system, or maybe even other counties. So we started coming up with these uh, plans that you, you see the details of on that diagram. And um, as the folks in Soteria, Vermont, or any, any, anywhere you are, uh, know there's so much involved in trying to actually realize these uh, alternative services. Um, our good friend Stephen Morgan, uh, who spent uh, time with us at Aslan for uh, weeks, uh, for a couple of years, really described how everything lined up there in, in Vermont, uh, kind of like the planets lining up. So then, you know, you get a chance to get something going. That's really been happening here in the Bay Area, too. So we've been going out and meeting with mental health administrators. We've had a couple of really good meetings with the new mental health director in the last couple of months of Alameda County. We've been meeting with the agencies on the ground. Uh, Mandala Project is a 5013C. We're a nonprofit group, but we don't have the licenses and the wherewithal to like open doors on these places. We need to get funding and partnership from these different entities. So we've been doing that and meeting with these uh, leaders that run these you know large uh residential programs in, in the community as well as like i said the mental health director and it's been really wonderful that the response we've gotten it's almost like a, it's an idea whose time has come and some of these people these you know key leaders in these uh, hierarchies say wow uh, i'm glad you guys are here i've been thinking about some of these ideas for some time but nobody's ever kind of come forward and and helped make it happen. So uh, Dina and I just had a meeting a week or so ago with Alameda County uh, mental health training uh, directors. So we've also, as well as trying to get a partnership with actual getting doors open on some of these services, we're planning some trainings on uh, Will Hall's part of our group now. And we're there's one called uh, the meaning, meaning of madness and all day training that we're thinking about uh, doing. And we got a good reception from the guy with a checkbook from Alameda County. So I just wanted to say that, that uh, I know the Mandala project emphasizes spirituality and spiritual emergence, but we also are very pragmatic. And uh, I think that's kind of a, a lead in to where I'll start talking a little bit about my own story, journey, and then uh, talk about some of the foundations for what we're doing here. Let me just also say quickly, though, uh, there's so much politics involved in anything has to do with mental health services. We know that. Uh, and so in the Bay Area, because of Jay Mahler and a lot of the activists in Alameda County, there's this huge political force that's actually challenging some of the reactionary forces here. It's called the pool of consumer champions. 
and there's 700 people uh, with lived experience who are part of this group. So when we go before the uh, Board of Supervisors or these other decision makers, we have all this juice, all this mojo behind us from this uh, really powerful grassroots uh, peer uh, organization. Okay, I just wanted to kind of brief that part of it. So I'm going to quickly talk about my own experience that happened about 50 years ago that basically is responsible for me sitting here today. That was the start of my extreme state uh, time. I was a young man living in a, in a small uh, community up in the Northwest. And it was during the ramp up of the Vietnam War. And uh, I had a lot of the early childhood adversity experiences that I think are often uh, involved in someone then later having an extreme state process. Um, my Both of my biological parents had left my sister and I when we were very young and we were raised by uh, my grandparents and I'd had some serious um, burns to my hand when I was a toddler and had been in the hospital for quite a while with skin grafts and all that. So I was a pretty uh, sensitive, anxious uh, boy who, when I kind of hit that glass ceiling of young manhood, when we all have to leave home and go get a job and start wanting to get in a relationship or go to college, or in my case, uh, go to Vietnam with the draft or not, I chose to join the Army Reserves and be a medic because uh, I didn't want to go to Vietnam. But I was I was really uh, kind of a prime candidate for some kind of breakdown, and that that did happen. And most of my friends there in that area were um, pretty gung ho about going to Vietnam and were joining the Marines and everything. So I, I felt more and more isolated, and. Uh, was not taking good care of myself with medicating myself with alcohol and daily uh, marijuana. And then one day I took kind of a fateful uh, dose of LSD and ended up in a, a really super bad experience from that. It was a dramatic shift then that happened for me within a day or two. I really felt reality, you know, as Dina was describing in Cardam too, how, you know, we can kind of innocently go along and not know these other inner experiences are possible. And then when they happen, it's so kind of profoundly uh, overwhelming. Uh, within a few days, I was in a kind of a full-blown extreme state where I, I started to, to hear voices and it had a real dark quality to it. It, it was um, the whole thing about spiritual emergence. I think we're hearing that spirituality isn't all light or ascension. Uh, a lot of the kind of initiatory elements of shamanism or people who go through what maybe some of you listening have gone through have those some of those elements of dark, um, painful, horrifying energies. And I'm you know, a licensed therapist now for a long time, and I know about all the things that have contributed to my psychological and emotional uh, early life. But I think there's, uh, again, as someone with a Jungian training, there's a dimension to our lives as humans here that have has a dimension of soul and mystery. And uh, I remember Jung, uh, one of his great quotes was, uh, two of them, uh, psychiatry has turned the gods into diseases. And then that, uh, you know, and not so long ago, people saw these forces as mana, demons, spirits, gods, uh, ghosts, uh, 
he said they those that realm of uh, experience is, is alive today as it ever was, but we, you know, in our Western rational enlightenment, we re refused to, to, to acknowledge that. That was the basis for his main split with Freud. So when I was plunged into this experience of uh, madness or extreme states, I had some of those uncanny experiences of feeling dark energy, sometimes holding me down on the bed with this kind of crackling, humming sound. And I was paralyzed and couldn't move. It was awful. I was just remembering it. It's always kind of a labor of love for me to tell this story because it, it brings back those awful traumatic memories. Um, well, sometimes I would be feel like I talk about an out-of-body experience, like I was some kind of ghostly presence. My my loci of control, as they call it, was up in the corner of the room, and I didn't even know where my body was sometimes. I had a, a persistent, hateful, kind of demonic voice that kept shouting, die, die, die. So that was pretty hellish. Uh, I think uh, that archetypal, mythical, uh, spiritual experience is is part of our human birthright but i think psychiatry has done a great disservice in their attempts to help by framing really all human emotional suffering and madness as um, pathological and so the whole medical model uh, that says these experiences are basically biogenetic uh, brain disorders. I think it's really a huge failure of imagination. So when I was going through my experience, uh, there was a shred of, I guess, ego, you'd call it, that was there. And I knew very well I didn't want to go and get help uh, because I felt this fear that was greater than what was going on to me that if I'd got caught up like Dina was, uh, there in a hospital that it would be worse than where I was. Let me say a little bit about where I was and the beautiful gift that was to me that then kind of set my course later to become a therapist. I was at my aged grandmother's who was in her 80s and was quite demented. She really couldn't tell you what day of the week it was very often, but she'd been an unconditionally loving person my whole life. So when I was going through this travail, I was able to stay there, thankfully. My parents were on the East Coast. I think if they'd been around, they would have probably, you know, out of love, tried to get me help, and I would have maybe ended up in the state hospital. Anyway, I, I rode this out at my grandmother's, um, and it went on and off for about a year. Uh, there was another experience uh, some of you may have had of when you're in these terror states or in these hallucinatory states. Sometimes time seems to stand still. I remember often being there at night at three in the morning with my finger on the line to the uh, emergency room in the hospital saying, if this happens one more time, uh, I'm going to call and get help. But I never did call. And uh, But soon I got exhausted. I mean, I wasn't sleeping, falling asleep would be an occasion of just being kind of devoured by all that dark energy. So I almost propped my eyes open to not fall asleep. And then one day in desperation, I was feeling like I'm so afraid to die, but I may have to kill myself to get away from this pain. Uh, there was a little book on my grandmother's shelf that I'd never looked at before. And I opened it up. It was a religious tract and I wasn't religious. I was an atheist. Uh, at that time, although all this dark stuff that was happening to me, I knew that I'd opened myself up to a universe that no empiricist could uh, believe. Um, I opened that book and my eyes went right to a sentence there that said, uh, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And it was like something just touched me here almost. It was 
like a spark of hope uh, came there, uh, of light, uh, that there was some, some dimension in the universe that understood uh, the condition I was in, uh, the, the rest that was being promised was that kind of soul rest. Um, and that was, that was a real turning point for me. I started to have, like I say, hope that maybe there was something that could balance this awful kind of existential world that I'd gone into, you know, this world where uh, some of you may have had this experience. You kind of almost have this psychic x-ray vision. You can be with friends or family or even with yourself, but kind of seeing through people's motivations. It was like uh, hearing people's expressions of love that were these mixed messages of hate at the same time. Uh, R.D. Lang talks about that, the mystification of experience. So when I got that uh, introduction to that there might be a loving presence in the universe, what a relief. I started to breathe easier, and I, in a, a night or two, I, I, just, I decided to risk going to sleep. And I kind of fell back into sleep, and there was all kinds of energy and actually lights going off like fireworks and stuff. And that was my first real night of sleep in I don't know how long. So after that, um, I started to recover and come out of that state that was not just cognitive or, or mental, but emotional, the emotional terror of uh, it's kind of seeing this dark vision of, of the world uh, never has left me. It's, it's, I, can, I can feel it today, you know, 50 years later. Uh, that's why some of the writings I've done on Mad in America in a recent journal article in the IP, ISPS Psychosis Journal is entitled, If Madness Isn't What Psychiatry Says It Is, What Is It? Uh, so that's been my kind of Zen cone for about 50 years. And after that experience, and I started to come out of it, I had a really rough time for many years, kind of getting my life together. I went back to medicating myself with drugs and alcohol and was homeless for a while. And, uh, but gradually I wasn't in an extreme state, but I kind of was trying to figure out what to do. I sure wish we'd had those peer supports and people like Dean and Carter and Ron and a lot of you at that point, because where I was, it was just like, either the state hospital or POW, you know? Um, yeah, I guess it was about 12 years later when I finally got my life together enough and went to college and at the school there, they had a, a, a collected works of Carl Jung. And immediately when I saw his writing, I knew that he'd been through something like that. And some of you may have seen his red book that's out now that recounts his experience. And then I started reading stuff about Artie Lang and the whole um, truth that rang true to me of how our culture is ins very insane in its ways. Lang talks about, you know, in the 20th century, us killing 200 million of our fellow human beings. Uh, that coincided with my existential vision of culture and friends going to Vietnam and coming back dead. So I ended up in the Bay Area in a graduate school program, uh, JFK University had a transpersonal program and started working in a traditional psychiatric hospital, a high-end one as an intern. And man, what a, what a confirmation of everything that I hadn't wanted. And, but I learned a lot about that uh, being there about a year. And then I heard about this place that it was a sanctuary that I was really looking to work in a place like that. It was called Iwar, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm going to try and speed this up because I know we're, we're short on time, but 
I ended up uh, in Jungian analysis with John Weir Perry, who uh, put together one of these sanctuaries in, in the Bay Area called Diabasis House. And I ended up doing my doctoral re follow-up research on Diabasis House. But this place I board was a sanctuary that um, was a 20-bed freestanding uh, place, no restraints, no medications, had uh, been open for about five years when I was there. It grew out of the uh, Esalen Institute Agnews Hospital research that they did at Agnews Hospital, where uh, it was the largest ever first episode psychosis study, NIMH gold standard randomly assigned uh, study. Uh, half of the group of young men got Thorazine and half got placebo. But John Perry and, and the guy from the, created I Ward Stanley Marison had set up the milieu there to have this kind of heart centered loving receptivity uh, for people. But at the end of um, three year follow up, the dramatic results were that the, the young men who didn't get the medication during their process had a 75% lower rehospitalization rate than the young men who did. So that opened up John Perry being able to go to San Francisco, open Diabasis House, and I Ward, where I worked. And uh, I'll just tell you quickly about the first person I worked with there and I Ward to show, I think, how all these dimensions of uh, our lives go into these processes We're in an extreme state. The first person I was assigned to work with, I said, well, she's in the back day room, go back there. And I went back and there was this young woman in her mid twenties standing on a table, totally nude in this ecstatic state of going over and over, heavenly, heavenly, heavenly. She was in this full blown extreme state process. If she'd been anywhere else, of course, they would have um, medicated her uh, at, at once and that wouldn't have gone on very long. But we believed that these processes were purposive, uh, transformative processes that people could go through just like they did at Diabasis or Soteri that was in San Jose. So we, much like Open Dialogue, brought her whole family in there on iWard. We did a lot of family therapy. So within a day or so, we had her whole family and network there. But she also shifted from being in that ecstatic state to this real dark state where she actually stood in front of me and said, in this hand is the Virgin Mary. And she went into that whole light transcendent state. And then she says, but over here in this hand is Satan. I am the daughter of Satan. And when she do that and kind of go like that and make your hair stand on end, so these mysterious processes we go through, I think extreme states processes that are so mysterious in our culture of, you know, reason first dismisses so much of it. She went through these poles of dark and light and good and evil and male and female and life and death that so often happens. And there was a huge expression of emotion that came and she came out the other side weller than well, as Carl Manager said. I know the clock's ticking, so I'm going to shift into just a brief kind of sample of some of these trainings I've been doing the last few years called uh, Responding to Extreme States with Loving Receptivity. And that was quite a uh, step for me to use the word love. I, mean, I guess in graduate school and all before, I'd never heard that taught. <laughs> Uh, although it, that's what was the main result that came out of my diabetes research, that there was a way of being with someone in an extreme state, kind of the subjective inner orientation of the caregiver can have a great impact on how the person in the extreme state responds and it really meets some great need they have to uh, be in contact with someone or a milieu like that. Uh, shortly before his death, Lauren Mosier and Matthew Morrissey and I were leading a workshop on extreme states. And Lauren and Matt and I agreed that 
from his experience at Soteria or Matt's at Birch House or, you know, Lang stuff, or Diaposis Eye Ward, kind of the necessary and sufficient conditions, a lot more is needed too, but kind of some basic requirements when people are in extreme states, uh, Mosier agreed that it's this kind of receptive being with. So let me um, kind of do a quick version of uh, this uh, way of uh, being with people in extreme states that I pretty much came up with for myself out of necessity being there on I ward with the people in these huge dramatic processes and then over the years I still see people every week in extreme states um, so if you would like you could um, uh, maybe sit back and if you feel comfortable you could close your eyes and I'll just do kind of a quick guided imagery, guided meditation on this. Um, and maybe start by taking a deep breath in. What it seems like is a good way to start, and I found for me, after all those years and classes on psychopathology and all, writing thousands of DSM progress notes, that if I could just kind of turn off the program or the black box that, you know, mental health professionals or family members or caregivers, peer people like myself, if we can just temporarily, don't worry, it'll come right back because it's so ingrained. If we can uh, kind of disconnect from the program of the DSM and psychopathology and biogenetic brain disease. Just put that on hold for a little bit and imagine another explanation for what the person's going through or another way of imagining that they may be in a natural transformative process, that they may be in uh, a purposive, uh, deeply challenging but uh, necessary a developmental process whether they're in their first episode dramatic episode or 10 15 20 years later out like dean and i uh, with a young man on the streets or someone who's been in the system for a long time that wherever they are in their life journey if we're able to be with them and imagine them almost from kind of a naive place where we kind of turn off our cognitive clinical gaze and scrutinizing and trying to assess what symptoms to just kind of be present like we would with a loved one if they're in some kind of distress, physical distress, emotional distress. And then once we're able to kind of shift into that more naive, non-clinical state, we'll be more receptive. And we could then really feel ourselves sitting in the chair with our feet flat on the floor and our breathing softening and our belly relaxed. And then just allow ourselves to focus kind of on our heart area of that uh, that caring feeling we have, whether we call it love or compassion or caring, just opening our heart to this other person. There was a friend of mine who's a um, psychiatric nurse and she was working on a new ward in the state hospital and a woman was there who'd been caught at catatonic for many years, hadn't spoken. This friend of mine, the nurse, was bathing this woman very gently and tenderly, and her heart really opened in, in caring for this woman she was bathing. And the catatonic tonic woman looked up to her and said, Mommy? It was the first time this woman had spoken in years, and that was the breakthrough that opened it up. So if we can be in that space of caring, and then really listening, just really uh, 
not feeling the urgency to ask a lot of questions or interpret, but just uh, listen. And yes, sometimes the person will be ready for a real engaged conversation like the young man Dina was talking about. But I think so many people get um, agitated when they really want to express themselves and there's no one there to receive it in this way. Again, whether it's in some kind of acute process, first episode or whatever, or long term. So this is pretty simplistic and some people may uh, not feel like it's uh, very valuable, but I found it's, it's really helpful um, to be with someone in that heart-centered way. And um, especially if they're agitated, uh, we can help them kind of feel more like we're feeling and we can help hold that space in that, that way that can be really valuable. So I think we're out of time for my section of this. So please open your eyes again if you had to close them and I'll turn it back over to, um, to Ron. And thank you all again for, for being with us today. Thank you. Um, yeah, great. Um, let's see here. Um, let me make this work right. Uh, so we've got a few questions. One that were written. One, Alan asked why I use the the term consumer. Does anybody want to briefly say something about that? Um, well, there's a um, long history around language, and um, currently in. Alameda County, um, we have what is called the pool of consumer champions. And so it is a term that is still used um, widely within our county. Um, I personally, you know, have issues with the term. I don't use it to refer to myself. Um, and, um, and, you know, sometimes I say person with lived experience. Um, I, you know, okay. yeah, that's, that's why we, we do go back and forth often because um, within our county, it's how it's used. And it, it was originally, I, I think, to empower the person, you know, when, uh, when people were being incarcerated <laughs> for mental health services, um, they, they felt like they didn't really have any agency. And so to say, you know, we're just consuming services we're just the consumer just like any other consumer you know uh it i think it took some of the stigma away uh but then again i think it became stigmatizing again and so we kind of moved more into a peer um model to refer to each other as peers uh and then even others have said what if we're just people so I kind of I kind of like that. That's kind of how I, I I live my life and and have my engagement and support experiences. Is we're just people who are doing the best that we can and and trying to. Uh... I can let Patricia O'Neill speak. Um, so Patricia, can you try to speak now and see if you come through, or you might have to select to share your microphone again. Yeah, there was something to click on that that speak now. Um, Dr. Cornwall, Dina, Cardam, thank you so much. This is heartening. It's uh, good to hear. Uh, we who try to take this approach feel isolated because most of the, the profession is in the medical model. And in Los Angeles, that's especially true. Los Angeles and his advice. So I just, I love attending these things because it gives me heart for what I'm trying to do. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to make one comment. We frequently get embroiled in languaging issues in, in these training sessions. And it's very frustrating because the amount of time that we few people spend trying to decide what we should or should not say or call each other, and I'm a consumer, provider, I'm a survivor, I'm a thriver, I, I know what the inside of a mental hospital looks like very well from many years ago. I'm now cured and free of meds and free of 
um, of uh, symptoms for years and years now, and the last step for me was the open dialogue reassurance that cure is possible. So I'm still calling my patients patients uh, because that's what I'm accustomed to. If somebody, and I ask them, do you have a word you like better? And then I go with each person and ask the word you like better. Okay. So, and it's very frustrating when we get involved in, you know, these kinds of discussions. Uh, this isn't about stigma, it isn't about what we're going to call each other. This is about extreme states, loving receptivity, and, and I'm so glad that we're talking about this. Question is, is there anything like unto the Mandala Project down here in the LA area? Because you are, <clears throat> you are, um, your panel on what you do and what you have, you know, I wrote, I wrote them down. It's just like a bunch of elements. It sounds a little bit like the PACT program, which we also don't have in this area. It's just a lot of good ideas floating around out there that we don't have access to. You know, I'm still trying to save up a few thousand dollars so I can go and take the open dialogue training and get certified for that. But it's a question of money. Because I focus my practice on people who have these special problems, a lot of them don't have a lot of money. So I'm not making the kind of money I could make if I was looking for high-end clients who want to hold hands with the worry, well, that's not why I went back to school at my age to do this. I want to work with people like you, Dina, and provide a different experience, or like you, Dr. Cornwell, like I was not provided with either. So okay. yeah, I know so do you guys have any ideas about the LA area? Does anybody know anything? Not, not off the top of my head, but what we have been, we've launched into our first phase, which is offering trainings. Um, and we've done a couple of trainings and some workshops. And so that's something that we're willing, those who are teaching these techniques are willing to do. And if there are you know, where so many of you are gathered, you know, there can be opportunities for training when there's a, a collection of like minds. Uh, that's basically how it, it starts. That's how ours started. We just decided we kind of flocked together because we all had this this intense desire to bring about change and systems change within our local system. And so through many meetings and, and heated discussions, um, we we came up with with where we are today, and so um, to be able to offer these types of the trainings, the techniques is something that can be transported uh, to particular communities. And then also, every community is different. The needs of each community uh, dictate what their their program schematic may look like. So it's not a not so much a cookie cutter. It's something that really worked within our system, uh, but we would be happy to um, offer trainings, uh, consulting to help um, folks in your area to create something locally. Right. As you were saying what you were saying, it occurs to me that the collective will is absent in the LA area, and I'm talking about not the will of the people who need help or want help. Okay. But the people yeah. who provide it. wanted to speak, and so I think maybe you can speak now. Um, yep. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, this is this is Amos talking from uh, Vermont. Uh, so exciting! Uh, what's going on with the Mandala Project? And to, to hear you guys making progress, it's it's really inspiring. Um, and to have everyone else contributing in, it is what what you know. This feels like a really hopeful time. Uh, despite some of the dark forces, uh, you know, that are also kind of uh, pulling things in other directions right now. And, and to what feels like kind of a, a, almost like a template that the Mandala Project's laying out from starting with the groundswell of people who, who uh, uh, are most strongly pulled by some of the needs in a, to, to move things in a different direction, to building alliances with um, allies who are more embedded within the traditional system, who, 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 who kind of have their hands a little bit closer on the purse strings and, and that those kinds of yeah. pieces, I think is a really critical uh, piece of it. Um, 
and the fact that it's so comprehensive uh, what you're doing, it, you know, to the different aspects of the program, um, uh, uh, really looking at people in so many different parts of, of you know, of, of the life journey or, or, or where people may, may be at to be able to, um, you know, uh, step into those places to offer the, uh, the caring and loving support. Um, so kudos, and it's, it's so great to, to hear uh, the headway. Thank um, and thanks a lot for this presentation. Uh, really inspiring and great timing for us. We're finishing up here at Sixth of Vermont, our first week of, uh, of training. And uh, so we're really excited for, to get going on our team here. Um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, um, for myself, my curiosity, and, and some of this is uh, my worldview of, of, you know, probably being a Northeasterner, um, you know, growing up in a much more secular kind of environment. Um, uh, and uh, the, the piece of spirituality um, and, and how that's kind of woven into the Mandala Project. Um, it, can you talk a little bit about how that's uh, uh, evolved and, and how that um, might impact um, or, or, or how to uh, uh, reconcile, maybe might not be the right word, but with some there's different people identify with different ways of understanding their experience. Um, and so can you just talk about a little bit about that piece and, 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 and how it might impact uh, different people? Sure. You know, uh, Amos, thank, thank you and congratulations on the Soteria of Vermont. You guys were also our inspiration. Yes, we're very excited <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, originally, um, I, I know, and Michael, you can also speak to this because you all had a, a excellent workshop um, prior to the workshop that we had for Alameda County. And it was looking at, and again, like Michael mentioned, Jay Mahler um, was very interested in that connection between intense spiritual experiences and what can happen to you if you are having one and there's not a contain a proper container for it. So for his personal experience, that's what landed him in the mental health, um, in, in being hospitalized and, and being um, just, just pretty much incarcerated in that system for 10 years because he actually had a, a, an, an extreme state experience of a spiritual nature. And um, so he galvanized some folks locally to uh, who had had similar experiences to to give a workshop and and also to just talk about the different elements of extreme states and I recall uh, he and I had met each other in we had run into each other in the in uh, elevator uh, in a different we were going to a different county training and he was asking me where I was from and we were kind of getting to know each other's background and he said I'm off to present a paper. Um, I think he said to Esalen, and I said, oh, what's it about? And he said, well, I had a, a spiritual experience, kind of an outer body experience. And I said, wow, that's really great because I, I wrote this, this thesis on people who had had outer body experiences. And, and you know, we started talking about the common now, how common that was and how it could be, um, how it's often misinterpreted. And so um, that kind of was the, the doorway for us beginning and, and assembling. And, and so Dina's experience was very much of a spiritual nature as well. Uh, Michael's another, some of our other, a lot of our other um, members had that. And so um, that was a, a point of entry for a lot of us to discuss uh, what it means to be in an extreme state, how we can um, reframe psychosis and um, develop a different language around it. And so, um, of course, spirituality, like Michael was mentioning, is not the only way that someone can experience an extreme state. And it's not always blissful. <laughs> it's very, it can be frightening. And so um, that was just the doorway, the opening to having the discussion. And then, um, then basically just boil down to what are people's needs when they're in an experience that feels overwhelming and, and more than they can handle, how best can we serve and, and be available to them so that they, they can make the most of it, they can find the meaning and, and, and integrate into their lives in a wholesome way. 
Uh, Amos, maybe I could quickly respond to you too. Uh, I worked for uh, 28 years full time as a therapist in Contra Costa County. So I'm very much into pragmatism and trying to get services funded and supported is really different in different areas. So the way it's been framed here in the Bay Area around the emphasis on spirituality, you know, may not be a way to try and get something started uh, in, in another community back east or, or somewhere else. There's some real fertile ground here for it. Uh, David Lukoff and Jay Mahler and some people did this mental spirituality initiative that was actually funded by the State Department of Mental Health. And they went out and got, I think, uh, 53 county mental health directors to sign on to language that said people who are in uh, psychosis, their word, there, there, is a, there is a spiritual uh, dimension to psychosis. This is, this is language the 53 mental health directors signed on to. There may be states where zero mental health directors would ever uh, say that. So, you know, the Bay Area in San Francisco, you know, sometimes rightfully so has kind of the reputation of uh, a lot of woo and uh, kind of new age, uh, I don't know what you call it, excess, but just kind of pragmatically to uh, get this uh, approved here where we are, it, it actually works in our favor. I'd like to quickly say that the, the whole spiritual emergency paradigm as put forward by Stan Groff, I don't completely agree with that because it kind of separates people with spiritual emergencies over here and maybe the rest of us with so-called mental illness or psychiatric disease over here. I think there's a, there's a real elitism in that. So I'm always uh, the one who's uh, saying, I'm glad I got a chance to say it today. That, you know, from my experience in Jungian training that, you know, kind of by definition, if any of us are in these extreme states, whether it's the first dramatic one or, you know, the, the soul who's in People's Park in Berkeley who's been there for 15 years, you know, kind of by definition, there, there, there's an archetypal process going on. Uh, so I think it's, it's a challenge to embrace this spiritual emergence, emergency model and keep it to where other people aren't stigmatized. So if, if I was back where you are, I would look long and hard. You've already got your thing going, but somewhere back east, some people may hear about Mandala Project and rightfully say, you know, we'd never be able to sell this spiritual emergency uh, kind of model to, uh, you know, decision makers here. Yeah, and again, our our leadership, uh, the director of behavioral health care, he was someone who was very interested in spirituality, and they put on a conference, a spirituality conference, uh, behavior, Alameda County Behavioral Health Care uh, did, and so we kind of created a presentation um, for that. And so we found that it's also served in other venues, including al alternatives and California Institute of Integral Studies. And so um, it's one of our presentations. Uh, it's a little different from the one that we present when we're presenting to um, the county um, providers. Uh, but when, we're, when we've had an opportunity to present to a general audience having an interest in spirituality, this is the one that, that we, we've been able to share. Am I here yet? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All righty. That was me. Well, I know that we're coming to the end of our time, and um, I wanted to say a couple of things. One, I have heard from, I've been able to hear from you um, and your perspectives before, and I found them to be, um, you know, to very much speak to my own experience um, and to be very affirming and growth enhancing. Um, and so I'm, through listening to you today, um, able to work on my own story just a little bit more and my own recovery just a little bit more. So I very much appreciate um, you being here today and the work that you're doing. Um, and I also just wanted to encourage the people who are still on the call. We've lost a few people. 
um, given the time. But I wanted to encourage people that if they are at all um, touched emotionally by the presentation today, to you know find a way to work on that really soon. You know, um, these things can be very powerful to listen to, and so sometimes you need to you know find someone to talk to or journal about it or you know work on it. Um, I don't want anyone to go away today feeling overly vulnerable and maybe just look on look to this as an opportunity to do a little bit more work because I find it like you know each conference I go to or each presentation by a mad person I find it to be another opportunity to work on my own processes. Mm -hmm. That's I really appreciate have. you saying that. Okay. Yeah, let's see. Um, I don't see the raised hands now and I do see a lot of people being thankful. Um, I'm wondering maybe if we aren't kind of like wrapping it up, and um, I do want people to be aware there is um, the next one in two weeks. We're going to have another meeting, and we're going to have Ann Silver, and um, she's going to be speaking about some of the history of approaches to, to psychosis, particularly Frieda from Reichman, who's one of the earlier um, psychoanalytic people, who really believed that um, you know that that people experiencing extreme states could cover fully and actually, um, you know, fully come back to life and even draw positive things from their experiences. So I think it's interesting to hear um, some of the older perspectives and compare and contrast. And, and she is particularly wants to look at what did they know back then that maybe we are still forgotten and we need to bring back to life that would be helpful. So it's not like they had it all together back then, but they had some interesting ideas, and, and it could be useful to hear that. So thanks again for everybody for coming, and I uh, hope you keep um, um, participating in these, um, these ISPS. You can look, go to ISPS website, just Google ISPS blog, and on that one you'll see a tab to look at for these online meetings to catch up on what's going on there. But thanks again to Michael and Artem and Dana. I don't even know if I'm saying, I am saying that name totally wrong. Um, but for being here and presenting your stories and your perspectives, it's been really great. All right. Bye.